we begin tonight with the new details of contact between officials at the highest level of the Obama-era Justice Department and that former British spy. Long after the FBI cut ties with this Christopher Steele character and the Trump dossier author, well, what happened? Bruce Orr, who was at the time a senior Justice Department official, continued to maintain extensive contact with Steele. He wasn't supposed to. This according to new emails Fox News has obtained. Bruce Orr's new connection to this whole sordid affair is only made worse when you consider the connection of his wife, Nellie. Now, Fox News has already confirmed that she worked for that outfit, Fusion GPS, during the 2016 election, explicitly hired to help investigate Trump and Russia-related subjects. And if you think the Trump legal team isn't following all of this, well, think again. Here's counsel to the president, Jay Sekulow. She had the number four at the United States Department of Justice. The number four. His wife happens to work for Fusion GPS, who happens to be retained to put together the dossier with Chris Steele. And Chris Steele happens to be talking to the FBI and to uh, Bruce Orr, the number four at the Justice Department. Christopher Steele gets fired for leaking information, yet Bruce Orr continues the ongoing dialogue. Unbelievable. In a moment, we're going to show you what could be false testimony that Fu Fusion GPS's Glenn Simpson gave to House investigators last year. But first, I want to bring in our powerful legal panel to break this all down. In Miami, Guy Lewis, a former U.S. attorney. In South Carolina, James Trusty, a former DOJ attorney in the criminal division. And here with me in studio, Robert Driscoll, a former deputy assistant attorney general. Welcome to all of you. Robert, let's start with this new information. I mean, Christopher Steele was not to have contact with the FBI after they had to disassociate themselves from him when he, against policy, right. was leaking information to the press. Now it turns out, from these emails that were discovered, that wasn't the case. He had ongoing uh, contact with members of the FBI, uh, including from, well, from August all the way through into 2017. Right. Yeah, and I think what's a little more disturbing is that his wife was working for Fusion GPS. I mean, it's, it's one thing to say the contact continues. Bruce Orr's wife from the Bruce FBI. Bruce Orr's wife. So, some people, you know, maintain contact with colleagues even after they're cut off or something like that. But where his wife had an interest in the Fusion GPS research getting pushed, the fact that Orr is the one that was involved in this is a little bit disturbing. Um, I think they're calling hearings next week sometime to determine, you know, kind of whether anything substantive was said or done. But certainly it's troubling. Um, yeah, Bob Goodlatte. Want, well, Bob Goodlatte wants to bring everybody back. Right. And Guy, let's go to you on this. Uh, it seems like getting information, key pieces of information out of the Justice Department, is, it, I mean, pulling teeth, pulling taffy, whatever you want to say, it's really difficult. But the information kind of trickles out slowly. How conceivable is it that Bruce Orr didn't know what his wife was working on? at Fusion GPS, the connection between Rush, uh, Trump and any Russian-related topics? Laura, not, not at all. I mean, come on. The, these guys, Orr and his wife, they shouldn't be touching anything on this with a 10-foot pole. It's so clear to me that there's a conflict, that there's an appearance of impropriety. They shouldn't have anything to do um, they shouldn't have had anything to do with this investigation, with this case, any submission to the FISA court, any of that business. And they know this. That's my problem. And, and, and I don't understand. I hope Congress continues to, 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 look, I love the Justice Department. I'm a product of the Justice Department. But they, Congress needs to continue to beat them over the head for more transparency, more transparency. That's what this case needs. Uh, James, your reaction to all these latest developments? Yeah, it's a huge red flag, Laura. I mean, I was with DOJ 17 years, seven in D.C., and I, I can't for the life of me figure out any good explanation for why Bruce, who I know, was sitting down with a decommissioned informant. And then to add to that, that the FBI had people there writing up 302 reports. I mean, it sounds like they had decommissioned this informant and fully intended to keep using him. That's one aspect of it that's troublesome. The other is to go back to the FISA warrants. The FISA warrants said, we, the FBI, speculate that maybe this was a politically motivated dossier, and they swear off that Christopher Steele knew that. 
I just don't understand how Steele could be having these meetings with Bruce, with Bruce's connection to Fusion GPS, and not likely know that there was a Hillary Clinton campaign source for the funding of the dossier. So again, big questions, still a lot to unravel, but absolutely red flags in terms of this process. Yeah, I want to I want to go back to a January 31st, uh, 2017 text exchange, which we just uh, got our hands on. And this is but this is um, remember the FBI specifically instructed Steele he could no longer operate or obtain any intelligence whatsoever. Yet Steele asks or in this exchange if he could continue to help feed information to the FBI, saying just want to check you are okay still in the situ situation and be able to help locally as discussed along with your bureau colleagues. I'm still here to help as discussed or texted back. I'll let you know if that changes. Steele replies, if you end up, though, I really need another bureau contact point number who is briefed. We can't allow our guy to be forced to go back home. It would be disastrous. Now, investigators, Robert, are trying to figure out who our guy is. Again, this is Steele, yep. have, who is not to have contact with the FBI, in contact with Bruce Orr, whose yep. wife works for Fusion GPS. Yep. Who's our guy? We can't, we can't allow our guy to be forced to go home. It would be disastrous. Must be some guy in the Justice Department, I would think. It, it, it certainly appears that way. I, I fear there'll be a failure of memory yeah. where uh, you know, people will say, my God, I sent thousands and thousands of texts. I just can't remember what that one was referring to. But it certainly appears that... that I mean, again, it appears there's an operation. I mean, you'd like to give people the benefit of the doubt and say, okay, maybe they were texting about baseball or something after the fact. There was some contact. But those emails, again, are pretty, pretty damning. Text exchanges, yeah. I mean, you know, it's, that, I've got to, I got to go, I got to go to you. Uh, and, uh, and, and this, I find this to be a, another uh, amazing development this week. There's been a lot of drama in the Paul Manafort trial. I know you've been following the ins and outs of what's happening with Judge Ellis. The special counsel Bob Mueller's team filing a formal complaint against the courtroom behavior of Judge Ellis. Uh, the prosecution writing, quote, the court's reprimand of government counsel suggested to the jury incorrectly that the government had acted improperly and in contravention of court rules. This could prejudice, uh, this prejudice should be cured. Uh, let's go to you, you guy about this. I mean, I've known Judge Ellis just <laughs> casually. I mean, he's a cantankerous, kind of old-style judge. But there seems to be a real effort, in my view, to kind of smear him now because he's been tough on the Mueller team. What's your take here? No, I, uh, there, I agree, Laura. Look, you clerked for the Second Circuit. You clerked for Justice Thomas. You do not, prosecutors, you don't win fights with federal judges. And you don't try to pick fights with federal judges. Look, I, I don't mind that the prosecutors are being aggressive, that they're standing up for their position. I don't know if I would have filed something like that and instead probably would have asked for a sidebar and said, hey, judge, you know, you, you told the jury, you said something yesterday. I'm not sure it was correct. Could you remind the jury that what you say is not evidence and, and you don't have an opinion in this case? That's probably how I would have handled it as the prosecutor. James, one of the uncomfortable exchanges, and there are many during the past few days. I'm sorry, but some of it is just entertaining. It, it, let's just say that. <laughs> There's one point where Judge Ellis thinks that Greg Andres, who, of course, is one of the lawyers for Mueller, is not looking at him. And so the judge says, <laughs> I'm here, Mr. Andres. is like, I'm here from the bench. Andres says, I'm sorry, judge, I'm listening. And Ellis says, I know, but when you look down, it's as if to say, you know, that's BS. I don't want to listen to you any, any more from you. Andre says, Judge, you continue to interpret our reactions in some way. We don't do that to you, and we're not being disrespectful in any way. Ellis says, all right, then look at me. <laughs> and he kind of, I mean, James, he kind of apologized, I guess, was it yesterday? For his, Things, you know, well, things get kind of out of hand, I guess. But wh what do you make of all this? It's just this kind of normal back and forth. I mean, I certainly, when I was pressing cases, I would not have taken the judge to task for reprimanding, not in the way they did, but they, they kind of feel like they have, a, you know, they have a head of steam against the judge. Well, they've, they've had a tough go at it. He's been very intrusive. He's been very opinionated. I mean, it's starting to sound like he's going to send Greg to bed with no dinner. 
at this point. <laughs> but, uh, but the bottom line is, you, know, you have to keep, a, keep in mind procedurally, if you're a defense attorney and you're getting kind of heckled from the bench during the trial, you actually have a remedy someday. You take it up to a higher court and you say, we didn't get a fair trial because he was making me look like an idiot in front of the jury. If you're a prosecutor and the case goes on and gets to be a, an acquittal, then you have no recourse. You can't go back and say, we got an unfair trial. So your recourse is either you take it or you file something or find some way to address it with the court. And I think they just hit a critical mass where they say, we're just going to have to take this on more publicly, not a sidebar, tell the judge, hey, here's a couple of instances where you're demonstratively yeah. wrong, which he was, and try to get him to, to kind of step back a little bit. Um, so it's, well, a, it's a tough spot for a litigant to be in, but I'm not really uh, critical of the fact they filed a motion because it's now or never. I mean, did... Didn't he kind of make that poor Greg Andres cry? Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, I'm sorry, but you have to have your big boy <laughs> pants on when you're before Judge Ellis. He's, he's a tough judge. Um, the, also, no, another thing that happened today, and Robert, I want to get your take on this. There was a mysterious recess this morning at about, I think it was like 10.50 or so. Uh, they had like a, a, a sidebar. Mm -hmm. Then it was a recess. No one, uh, it was not explained. Yep. Then they readjourned after two. Yep. And then they started talking about how Rick Gates uh, took out a loan, I guess, for $200,000 for, you know, sports tickets. Right. I mean, is, is that normal to have that you start in the morning, you have a recess for four hours, and you come back? Maybe Ellis just wanted to cool things down? Uh, it's, it, it's just speculation because we don't know. But, but what, I, what I've heard around the, the courthouse and from other people I know down there is it may have been a jury issue. Yeah. Because when he left, he didn't go... It was go, under seal. He, Tom, yeah. He didn't, go back, he didn't go back to chambers. He went in the direction of the jury room. He didn't go out the chambers ah. door. He went in the same direction as the jury box or the jury room. So there, there yeah. may have been a jury issue that he was talking to them about. Either someone read a newspaper or someone, ah, you know what I mean? But it's under seal, we'll, so we don't know. So but we it was, don't know. But, of course, I'm watching it, like, minute by minute, what's happening. Right. People are doing a great job of blogging about this. I was like, wait a second, it stopped. I need this to keep going on. It's very right. – I wish it was in the courtroom. It's actually really fascinating. All right, finally, guys, I want to get everyone's thoughts on whether President Trump will actually finally sit down for an interview with Mueller's team or whether Mueller – We'll have to issue a subpoena and everything that that entails. Uh, let's go to you, Robert, on this. Oh, sorry, Robert. I want to go to James. I just went to you. James, go ahead. All right. Well, and uh, look, I don't think Mueller himself feels like he has that strong a hand to issue a subpoena here, or at least to get the kind of compliance he wants. Why? There's a lot of layers of, well, there's a lot of layers of why the president shouldn't have to face a subpoena while in office. But, you know, executive privilege kicks in. Um, and frankly, the fact that they've called the president a subject makes it very tough for me to understand how they could ask questions about obstruction, because the obstruction angle is purely target. So I think what they're looking at is what are our chances if we actually subpoena him? We are going to get a motion to quash. What's it going to read like? And I think a motion to quash filed by the White House would be pretty damning and pretty powerful in terms of addressing everything they want to complain about when it comes to the Mueller probe up until, you know, calling him a subject but treating him like a target. Guy, is there any way that the special counsel will accept the terms that Trump's legal team offered? Laura, not in a million years. Um, the, the president will never sit down uh, voluntarily and speak to these guys. Uh, he'd be crazy to. Um, the special counsel, I think Bob is tough as a nail. He's, he's hard as a rock. He'll uh, issue the grand jury subpoena and then they'll file their motion wow. to quash and it'll make its way up through the Supreme Court. Well, Eventually, that's gonna, that, that's gonna be, we're going to have you guys back a lot when that happens because that's going to go on for some time. Fantastic conversation, guys. Thank you so much. Have a great weekend.